On 100.9 WXIR, this is Evidence of Design, and I'm your host, Jason Taylor. Good morning, and thanks for listening to Evidence of Design on 100.9 FM WXIR in Rochester, New York. I'm your host, Jason Taylor, and this is episode 23 of Evidence of Design. I'm really glad to be here, and I thank WXIR for being such an asset for the Rochester community. For those who are new to the show, we investigate and critique the systems and structures that produce income and wealth inequality in modern America. You can find our past episodes on YouTube by searching for Evidence of Design, episode 20, let's say. And you can also find us on Facebook by searching for Evidence of Design, 100.9 WXIR. And you can connect with us via Twitter, at EvidenceDesign101. Normally, we're live for you and would invite you to give us a call, but on today's show, we are pre-recorded. We're taking a small detour this week. And I'd like to invite you to listen to two discussions. The first is a discussion with a friend and colleague, J.D. Flores. J.D. advocates for rights for individuals with disabilities, and we discuss how society can be more inclusive of all individuals. The second is a discussion with friend and co-host, Matt Treadwell. We share our reactions from the first and only primary debate from the Democratic candidates for New York State Governor. We'll start with my discussion with disability rights advocate J.D. Flores. I started by asking her whether disability advocacy was her job, and here's her response. No, no, no. It's definitely uh, my purpose. Um, I wouldn't call it a job or, you know, like a, a hobby or anything like that. It's, um, it's something I've been doing since I was a kid. Um, my parents came to this country uh, with nothing for me because I was born with a disability and we were in Puerto Rico and, uh, you know, the medical system there is, is terrible. I probably would have died had they not made the choice to come here. So, uh, it's definitely something that is so much more than just, uh, a passion project. Um, it's something that I take to heart. It's something that I take seriously and it's something that I feel is very needed and it's a part of my everyday. So, at any time that I feel like I need to jump in and say something or do something, I do. Um, there's very little times where I don't. Um, and I try to really bring in all my intersections when I do, when I do have my advocacy hat on, because I represent so much more than just my disability. Um, you know, my parents came here, like I said, from Puerto Rico. They don't speak English. Um, we're not the richest people in the world. So there's a lot of different, uh, you know, identities that I have that um, aren't necessarily all talked about at once. So I try to bring that to the table every time that I can. But again, it's it's not my job and it doesn't really pay. No one really wants uh, to pay an advocate for what they know. Um, they do value the information being shared, but they don't value it monetarily. Hmm. Would you mind explaining a little bit about your disability, J.D., that you identified? So I have cerebral palsy. Um, what I'm assuming happened just from knowing what cerebral palsy is, uh, my mom was in labor for a really long time and they decided uh almost at like 12 o'clock at night that um it was too late for her to have a vaginal birth um and so they decided to have a c-section so um what i'm assuming happened is during the c-section there was a time where i lost oxygen um and so once you lose oxygen there's no way to re to, re to gain that back um, so it affected um, the different parts of my brain that have to do with fine motor skills um, and movement. So I, I lack balance. Um, I don't walk. Um, I can with crutches, but it's, it's hard. And cerebral palsy also includes like muscle spasms. So my muscles spaz um, often. So it's, um, I have very limited range of motion, fine motor skills, um, and that all of that. Anything that I do have, I had to work up to get to. Um, but it all happened because I lost at some point during birth, some oxygen. Um, 
and that changed the chemistry of my brain and how my brain operated. And in layman's terms, really, is your brain sends messages to all your limbs to move and to do things. My messages are just a little slower than everybody else's, which is why I can't walk. Um, and there's different things that I can't do with my hands. Um, you know, I can't turn my hands right side, uh, like face palm up. Uh, and I don't stretch out all the way because of the spasms. Uh, so I'm like at a per it's like I'm a piece of bacon. I'm a little crinkled. <laughs> so that's pretty much like the easiest way to explain it. And this may be an obvious point to some listeners, but it, JD, do you have a definition of disability? Because it can manifest in so many different ways. And so you mentioned cerebral palsy, which is something that uh, you have and identify with. What else is disability? What is your definition of disability? Well, uh, the definition of disability varies from, from organization to organization, from person to person. The definition of disability has grown so much. It is uh, super broad. Um, but if I hear a story, I can tell you where the disability is there. Mm. But I guess if, I, if you had to put me on the spot and say, I think it's just something that it impacts your quality of life, um, limits you in, in a way. Um, but I don't want the people to take that when I say limit you in a negative way. I mean, when I say limit you, it's not because it's you that's the problem. It's because the people around you are the problem um, and the systems around you. Um, they're the limits. Mm. You're not the limit. Mm -hmm. You know, you can pretty much do what you want. It's, it's really other things around you that make it difficult. I think that's an important question. And I, I appreciate your response because I, I struggle with language. You know, language is power. Language is really important. And so I, I, I don't think it's fair to say, you know, you have a disability or to say this individual has a disability because it's just, I think the point is disabilities and definitions of it and manifestations of disability are contextual and it depends on your perspective. For example, you could have what could be a medically classified disability. So I'm thinking that cerebral palsy is probably a like a medical thing that doctors will say that you have and it comes with its own culture and social construction of, of sort of baggage with that. But you can also have other forms of disability that are more functional, perhaps, that aren't necessarily your fault, but maybe that the world is constructed. Well, see, you're, uh, the weirdness that you feel about it, right? It, it's really constructed because there are no people with disabilities invited to the table. Mm. So prior to this interview, you, you didn't have access to someone to speak to to really see wh what language you should use and mm -hmm. how it you know, what are the proper things to say? Because we're not invited to the table. So it's hard to really decide how to address or how to say things when, you know, you're always missing that one story at the table, because then you're always just guessing and checking and hoping that you're right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not fair to, I'll give you an example, but it's not fair to put two oppressed groups together. But, um, you know, before, you know, we started being conscious of, of using the right and proper pronouns, we didn't know how to do that because we didn't have folks at the table. And now I'm not saying that people are always at the table because they're not. We're still working on that. But one seat at one table makes a hell of a difference. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I say hell? Is that okay? <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Um, makes a big difference, you know, having that one story at the table um, to be able to tell you, like, hey, that's improper for you to say. Um because how else would you know? And so that's why you feel weird about it. Because um, if you've never heard it, right? Like it, we're not the hot topic. We're not the folks that you always talk about. So you don't have someone telling you like, hey, that's not the proper way to address someone with a disability. This is how you should say it. And honestly, it, it should only be that power should only be in our hands, right? Because we're the ones who address, I mean, excuse me, who identify as people with disabilities. So we should be able to tell other folks how to discuss us. Um, but only that can change once we start getting invited to the table, once we get to start writing our own stories, telling our own stories, you know, being accounted for when we, you know, account difference um, in a diverse circle. But until that happens, there will always be that weirdness that you just had mm -hmm. trying to understand how to describe someone um, or how to address someone in a, in a, politically correct way mm -hmm. you know that doesn't make them feel ostracized but that conversation has to happen and those folks have to be invited but until then you know we'll always be at this stalemate kind of thing if that makes sense yeah and it's something that you speak about otherization and, and absolutely that 
Uh, you also spoke earlier about intersectionality, JD, in terms of uh, occupying different social spheres, whether it's gender or race or disability. And I think it's important to point out to listeners something that really struck with me is that I was once told at some point by someone that we're all going to have a disability some way. And especially a great example is growing older. So when you grow older, you lose the ability to maneuver around the world in the way that you used to or whatever, quote, normal people maneuver. And it always really struck with me to think that, you know, disability isn't this thing out there that only people have if a doctor tells them that they have it. Uh, disability is sort of within all of us in different manifestations. And so what do we do then in t- as from your perspective in disability rights advocacy? How do we get people to the table? Well, I mean, I think we have to make it a priority, um, you know, especially, you know, when we're constructing new things, you know. It's different when we're talking about something where, where we're trying to retrofit something. I think my biggest issue is watching new things be built, um, watching new programs be made and all these other things. And it still not be invited to the table because that means that we're making the choice, like the conscious decision to not be inclusive. Um, I think that uh, it's something that we can't be afraid of. It's something that we need to be able to discuss openly. Um, it can't be this taboo thing that we're afraid um, to even touch. And it's something that we have to realize it's a real thing. You know, currently, you know, the new numbers just came out. One in four Americans are disabled. One in four. Like, that's not a that's not a small, you know, ratio. Like, that's major. You know, we're the biggest minority in the country. Um, and we we don't often you know there's not a face to us there's not a there hasn't in my opinion been a major introduction to people with disabilities in this country or you know in our historically where have you heard of anything you know as a disability rights advocate like the biggest thing historically is when the americans disabilities act passed but that's only you know important to me because of what it did for me that's not important to you because why would it be like you know what i mean like it wouldn't make a difference to you if there were curb cuts or not. You know what I mean? It wouldn't make a difference to you if there were elevators in a, in a building or not. Um, so I think we just have to be conscious of the new things we build. We have to be conscious of the things we're trying to retrofit and really ask ourselves the hard questions like what is missing here? Um, because that'll be the only way that it'll, you know, stick in your mind. And then also just, you know, look around and, and to me, social media is so powerful there's so many times on social media where people with disabilities have the platform to really speak their mind, to really talk about the issues that we're facing and people just don't see us. Like that's just, it's just a conscious effort that people have to make um, because they don't want to see us until it's too late. Right. And then now you're culture shocked because you broke your ankle, you can't walk and you're using crutches and now everything is super difficult for you. And that bar you used to go to cause it was your favorite um, you're struggling to use the bathroom there because you had to go down a flight of stairs. You know what I mean? Like, so these are things that uh, you didn't think about until it happened to you. But if you would pay attention to what, like, the what's happening, you could see it. And then, you know, really, we need to start holding people accountable for their lack of effort, for their lack of uh, awareness. You know, it's it's not anyone's fault when they don't know anything, but you could have. So also said something that struck me where, you know, I'm not sure what the individual or the Americans with Disabilities Act has, but my understanding is that disability rights advocacy is mutually beneficial or at least should be because when folks get curb cuts, I mean, it helps me as someone who doesn't need to use a wheelchair to get around. It helps me to push heavy objects up on curves. <laughs> and uh, if folks have trouble hearing, they invented subtitles and that helps me when I'm at the gym working out, looking at a TV. Um, it helps when the various educational legislation came about to help protect and advocate for students with disabilities when IEPs, individualized educational plans and program or programs came out that helps teachers become better educators by focusing on the specific learning needs of their students. And therefore that should help all students. And so I, I think there's room here to, promote awareness for folks who maybe who don't have a disability or at least who don't self-identify as someone with a disability to see how learning about and learning from 
and with folks who do have disabilities to say uh, it's mutually beneficial for us living in the society together by understanding each other's needs. You're listening to Evidence of Design on 100.9 FM WXIR. This is an interview I recorded with friend, colleague, and disability rights advocate J.D. Flores. We're discussing how society can be more inclusive of all individuals, particularly those with disabilities. Here, we continue our discussion on not just functional inclusion, but systemic inclusion. When we were talking earlier, we were talking more about these functional things that could change to help individuals with disabilities, at least some disabilities, like adding subtitles or curb cuts. And now, from what I'm hearing, is a lot of not just functional things, but also social and institutional things that need to be in place to support individuals with disabilities. Uh, for example, if you just cannot come to class for a week, or if your wheelchair breaks and you cannot move, then hopefully our institutions are responsive to that and teachers will, you know, be flexible and not fail you or whatever like that. Like those things need to happen. And so from a, a disability rights perspective or disability advocacy perspective, like how, where in society can we do better? Where does the advocacy push us to be more responsive to not just those functionally disabling things, but those socially and institutionally disabling things? Where can we be going in order to be more inclusive as a society? I think really, um, and this is like really something I, I want to achieve in my lifetime, um, we need youth groups to include kids with disabilities. We have so many great programs um, even in our little city who has no money, <laughs> like we have so many great programs for young people, um, but they're not inclusive, you know, they're not inviting for people with disabilities. They're not accounting for that. The kids with disabilities, you know, transportation is a major issue for everyone in our city. Like that's just overall an issue, but for people with disabilities, it's 10 times harder. So, you know, when you don't include these kids in these programs, you know, they're not socializing, they're not having, they're not creating social capita, but then you're also limiting the opportunities that they can have. And so what you're saying to them then is that there's this program, but we don't, we can't help you. We've already decided that you can't be a part of this because of the way the program is structured. So I really think it, it starts with a lot of targeted programming. And then when we, you know, those folks who are designing these programs have to be aware of what are the real issues and how can we be inclusive and what else do I have to do? You know, there's so, like I said, we're rich in some youth programming and maybe some folks feel differently, but, you know, we have teen empowerment. We have in control. We have the center for youth. We have different after school things. And how many times do you see these programs and then do you see people with disabilities, physical disabilities, you know? Um, like I said, there may be a lot of them with invisible disabilities, but how many times do you see folks with physical disabilities a part of these programs? You know, not often. I know a, a group of kids who could, you know, who have so much to offer, but they're not welcome in these spaces. And then that's not fair. Like, you know, Team Empowerment does a lot of things when it comes to poetry and writing and stuff. You know, how... You, so what you're saying is kids with disabilities can't do that, that you can't welcome them in that space, that they don't have something to say. Um, and again, this could just be, this is just my opinion, but I, I think it, it needs to start there. It needs to start in us including our youth into programs so that they can start planning for their future and so that they can feel like they're a part of something and they can have a social circle. A lot of people with disabilities die young because they don't have friends. They don't have a social circle. Um, this guy that I often present with, his name is Al Condalusi, and maybe not often, I presented with him once, but I've seen him multiple times. <laughs> he studies uh, a lot of friendships and, and social connections for folks with disabilities. And so he said that there's 100, you know, able-bodied folks have 150 relationships, right? These are just th that you may encounter in your everyday life. People with disabilities have 25 that's like 25 and so that's the thing like we don't have th those social circles we don't have those folks 
that we're reaching out to, that we're talking to, that we're doing all these things for. And, and, you know, and sometimes it's hard because depending on your disability, you know, socializing may not be the easiest thing, but it's proven that we need it. The science says it. So we have to be conscious as people, you know, who are a part of the community to include. Um, in that's an it's going to take effort it's not going to be easy but we have to do it and if it's an opportunity and people don't take it then that's a different story than it not being an opportunity at all yeah so i, I hear you uh, saying that we need more people with disabilities at the table you said that before but i also struggle and i'm kind of playing devil's advocate but also genuinely wondering jd where uh you keep bringing up this point where you don't see individuals mainly with physical disabilities because usually you can actually see those whereas you know intellectual disabilities are uh, because that's not my business to know if someone right. it, it has an yeah. invisible disability it's not mm. my business to ask them or or right. require them to tell me disclosure is all your choice right mm. you can and never will i say to anyone that i have to know that like disclosure is your choice and if you choose not to share then you know i just don't know and that's okay you're i'm perfectly fine with that mm -hmm. but i don't have a choice of disclosure mm -hmm. Like you, I'm wearing it. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that's a flaw of minds where I automatically just only speak from the perspective of someone with a physical disability. But again, that's, that's what I wear. That's who I am. Mm -hmm. Sorry for cutting you off. No, not at all. I'm, that's helping me think through, like I could hear someone say that, look, you were the only individual in your high school with a physical disability out of 800. And at the same time, you're saying that we need to create social spaces that are more that have more representation from individuals with uh, physical disabilities. What if someone is saying there's simply not that many folks out there with physical disabilities to be represented in all these places and that they are already naturally represented? I think that I would still say, even if it's not a physical disability, you need to have folks with disabilities at the table. Um, because in my opinion, I don't think that happens. Right. I think that, uh, what as a society what we've become accustomed to is we already know who we want to help before we even create anything right so when we're creating these new programs when we're creating these new projects buildings whatever we already can see who's going to be in there you just can't see me you know and it doesn't have to be someone like me it doesn't have to be someone with a physical disability people with autism have issues with lights have issues with sound have issues with space um, and you can't necessarily see someone wear autism, right? But you know they have it. You know, uh, you don't know they have it, sorry. But if they have it, you have to be able to create some sort of baseline environment that they can be welcome in and, and participate in. Uh, I don't think we have those baseline environments. I don't think any of the things that we have that exist right now are baseline. I think that people know who they're going to service. They know who they want to be a part of that group. Um, and maybe I'm wrong, but that's just what my life experience has taught me because there's plenty of times where I've sat at certain tables um, and I can just tell as the conversation is going, oh, you're not talking about people like me. You're not talking about people that look like me. You've already decided who you're going to help. Um, and I like it. There's, I like to say that there's some folks in some causes who choose a token disability. And because they chose that one, they say, well, we we should be okay because we've decided that we're going to help, you know, people who are visually impaired. But what about someone who is visually impaired and has this? Or, you know, autism is a hot topic right now, right? There's so much money in autism because there's so many, you know, the the ratio keeps changing and it keeps growing and it's it's like an epidemic. So there's so much money studying it right now. So a lot of the spaces that you see are being created for people with autism. But what about the folks with autism who are also physically disabled? You know, so in my opinion, we have to be conscious of our bias already. Because what we're saying is when we create these things, we already know who's going to fill this, this table up, right? So I think it's just being super aware of how you're planning and doing things and being prepared for anything. Um, and that's not going to be easy and I don't have a perfect way of doing that, but um, we have to create those spaces without already in our minds having 
who's going to fill those spaces. That's really powerful. And I wonder, I mean, I'm always making comparisons to education because that's kind of where I work in and that's where I think a lot about. And I can say, at least in some sectors of the educational field or institution, that there's a lot of progress being made in terms of thinking widely and inclusively about how different students learn. And so I remember when I was growing up and I had aspirations to be a teacher, I was like, yeah, you just have to be really intelligent and you have to be a good public speaker and you have to be organized at giving out textbooks and notes, (laughs) you know, and that's how I kind of thought that education was. And then I've really been stressed and pushed and uh, pushed and having to seen and work with youth, how, uh, different ways of learning manifest in each individual person. And I'm thinking that that might be a useful metaphor to think about that in society and just we could do a better job at society of being inclusive towards our, all, everyone's individual needs, whether or not you can see them in, let's say, a physical disability or if there's something harder to see like autism but maybe comes out when you start talking with the person in a social setting or even those disabilities that perhaps are almost entirely invisible. Um, you know, I, I'm just wondering how we can be better at always trying to be inclusive and thinking in that way it's exhausting it's exhausting it is is, but i think if you make it part of the design it it wouldn't be right like the first couple times of course that's like tying your shoe the first couple of times bunny loops what like you want me to crisscross where and you're like oh my god i'm never gonna pick this up and i think of it too like in college, right, you get a syllabus and you start looking through the syllabus and you look at all the assignments and you're like, I'm never going to be able to do that. <laughs> like, I'm never going to, what? And then you finish and you're like, oh, I did that. Like, okay, cool. So I think if it becomes part of the design, then it, of course, the first couple of times, because again, I'm not asking for perfection ever. I think as humans, we are meant to be imperfect and that's perfectly okay with me. But we need to have that option. You know what I mean? And I think it becomes limiting when you don't have that option. And so if it becomes part of the design, if it becomes part of everybody's checklist, then, again, like the first couple of times is going to be hard. Even like the whole theory of different learning styles. That probably wasn't easy for teachers who had been in the game for 30 years when this theory came out. But as time went on, the fact that people have different learning styles became a more easier theory to understand and to really process. And now it's a a, a thing that you want to teach students to identify with. Learn your learning style so that when you're in a classroom and you don't understand something, you can say something to someone and say like, Hey, I'm more of a visual learner. Can we do it this way? You know, these are some things, these are things that we have already changed. We've done it. So, but it had to become part of the design. You know, it had to be part of the curriculum. It had to be part of the trainings. So it's even the fact that pronouns, right? Not all the time they're perfect, but in a lot of the trainings that you're going to now, you'll be asked to say, hey, Jason, what are your pronouns? How would you like to be addressed? Because it's part of the design now. So we have to start including it in the design. You know, we have to start asking the questions like, how could we be more inclusive? What are the, what are the markers that we're missing? Or having a conversation, but it has to be part of the design. And like I said, it doesn't have to be perfect, but you have to make it so that you're thinking about it as you're creating. Thank you for promoting the title of this radio show called Evidence of Design, where <laughs> we think it's very important, Matt and I, to look at all times the uh, the evidence of how you're designing things, because there's that tells you very much how the world is constructed, so... Right, so I... That wasn't planned, No, it wasn't. It definitely (laughs) wasn't. But I invite people to look at, like, modern-day architecture. You're listening to Evidence of Design on 100.9 FM WXIR. That was an interview I recorded with friend, colleague, and disability rights advocate J.D. Flores. I hope you enjoyed it. For the remainder of the show, we'll talk about the Democratic candidates for governor of New York. On Wednesday, August 29th, The first and only primary debate aired between candidates Andrew Cuomo and Cynthia Nixon. You can find the debate online. Cynthia Nixon is challenging incumbent Andrew Cuomo for the Democratic ticket for New York State Governor. Both candidates are on the ballot this upcoming Thursday, September 16th, 
in the state primary election, and our next governor will be chosen on Election Day, Tuesday, November 6th. Co-host Matt Treadwell and I watch the debate, and we share our analysis and reactions. I start the discussion by asking Matt about his first impressions. Well, so I didn't really pay too much attention to the coverage surrounding it, but I did notice something in uh, the city paper, city of Rochester paper, that said something like Cynthia Nixon complaining about or, or making making a statement on her, on her on herself being much more progressive than Andrew Cuomo. Um, and yet the paper seemed to say that it was difficult to see or it was difficult to tell on which policies she actually diverged from him. So I was sort of primed by that and expecting a poor debate in the sense of that I, w I felt like it was going to be a lot of name calling, a lot of like touting their their, their own reputations, a lot of oh, you didn't do this, or you didn't do that, uh, rather than focusing on what their plans are for specific issues. Yeah, it's tough with only an hour-long debate, but I, I agree in that I think the debate was worthwhile to, to at least catch up or get a snapshot of both of the Democratic contenders for governor. Mm -hmm. And for listeners who are unfamiliar with both of the contenders, Cynthia Nixon, on one hand, is a former actress. Maybe she's still acting, but she was in Sex in the City, I believe. Yep. And she's running for governor, and her platform, uh, she talks a lot about LGBTQ plus rights. She talks about women's rights. And her main sort of shtick, I think, is e equitable educational funding. That's kind of what she always goes back to, and it, that seems like what her past experience in politics is. Well, she opened with that. That's right. In the debate tonight. Yeah, so equitable educational funding. And she's been called, at least in the media, and like you said, Matt, you know, she's sort of portrayed as the farther left of the two candidates she called herself a democratic socialist right so they actually invoked that term and yeah she called herself a democratic socialist so that you know i didn't get too much democratic socialist stuff from her from that debate there was a moment when she she said she would forgo her governor's salary mm -hmm. and and uh, in the i guess spirit of democratic socialism right so she would forgo her hundred and eighty thousand dollar governor salary and just uh, turn it over to the state coffers or something like that. But right. So she's the candidate on the other hand, and then she's against uh, Andrew Cuomo, who is the current incumbent. So he's the current governor of New York. I believe he's finishing his second term as governor. So second uh, term meaning he's been a governor for eight years. He's running for his third term. Andrew Cuomo has a long history in politics. His father, Mario Cuomo, was the governor of New York State. That's right. And Andrew Cuomo himself, hes we learned in the debate, I actually didn't know this, is that he served in Bill Clinton's administration as the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, of which Ben Carson is the current uh, incumbent in that seat. That's so right. Cuomo has served in that position in the federal government in the late 90s. He has served as New York's Attorney General, and of course, he is the current governor of New York State. Mm -hmm. of which his father was. So Andrew Cuomo has been around for a while. He has a considerable political background. He strikes me as sort of like the Hillary Clinton of this uh, debate. <laughs> he has experience. Right. He, he, on paper, he has a pedigree. That, that's right. So on paper, he seems like the right candidate if you're looking at it in, in like a resume type of way. Mm -hmm. uh, he, his sort of, it seemed to me, Matt, that his platform was very much anti-Trump. He has sort of again and again always turned points over to say well you know new york state is the progressive beacon under my stewardship new york state is the progressive state and we have to do something about this trump guy because he's a problem yeah yeah he he invoked trump's name at almost uh, there, there was at least one instance where it felt almost inappropriate like i wasn't even expecting it to happen but he mm -hmm. was like i don't exactly remember what the question was right now but he just completely turned around the statement or the or the question to say something like but we need somebody to stand up against trump and it, re it reminded me of of like <laughs> it reminded me of rudy giuliani running for mm -hmm. president in the 2008 uh election and his constant invoking of 9-11 mm. as a way to garner support so yeah i you know cuomo's campaign 
sort of uh, shtick there was, was interesting to me because he is invoking at all times the ability to go against Trump, and that's something new for Cuomo. So my personal belief is that I don't find Cuomo to be the most liberal guy. I've never seen Cuomo as the most left guy, but especially since Trump has took office, and perhaps especially because this, you know, he's running for another term in the governor's seat, he is striking himself as the liberal candidate. And so I think he's kind of wielding that as his, his power here, and he's, he's moving left on a lot of positions. For example, and this was pointed out in the debate, that Cuomo was never really for the legalization of marijuana, but in the debate he has now said, you know, he, he had a bunch of a panel of experts do a report, and now he says that the, the benefits of legalizing marijuana outweigh the negatives. Yeah. And he also, in a number of other places, uh, really brought up just the fact that whatever problems there are, whatever major institutional problems there are, it really comes from the federal government to fix it, and not necessarily the state. Right. For instance, he brought up, well, when the issue of single-payer health care was brought up, mm-hmm. he made a point to say that other states, like California, had tried to do it, but that he felt it was impossible to accomplish without federal backing, basically. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I think that's a normal position for the incumbent to make, where when they're really saddled with problems, it's easy for the incumbent to say, like, look, I mean, I can't magically do it. On the flip side, it's really easy for someone like Cynthia Nixon, who's never been in that high-level political position before, to say, like, I want to do all of these things. Right. And I actually respect Cuomo, maybe a different me, like a, a, a younger me, you know, two years ago would have seen this debate and really been angry at Cuomo and thought he was deflecting. But I actually left the debate feeling like Cuomo was portraying a very fair account of his... Realistic? Yeah, a realistic account of what he can or can't do as governor. He brought up the MTA, the Metro Transit Authority in New York City. He did say that, like, the governor... Or, sorry, the state can't just fund the MTA according to whatever it wants. So so he went into the details of like how New York City had spent, you know, twice as much as the state historically and then under Cuomo's administration the state has been spending, spending four times as much as the city. And I, I don't know the veracity of all of those numbers, but the point is he's at least portraying some realistic hurdles institutionally in trying to govern effectively. And again, whereas before I might have looked at those things and kind of rolled my eyes or said boring or said he's deflecting, I don't know. I I just left having a lot more sort of sympathy with some of those difficulties. I don't know if you felt the same way, Matt. I'm. It's difficult for me to say, honestly. Like you said, I don't really know the veracity of his claims. I didn't feel, I didn't feel like he was lying, hmm. at least in that particular instance. I felt like, like he was being upfront about the difficulties of, uh, of uh, maintaining the MTA. There were there were certainly instances where like I brought up earlier where I felt like he was grasping certainly when he kept on invoking Trump's name and saying how he needs we need somebody to stand up to him and um there was a very peculiar instance where he was like shouting at Cynthia Nixon that she was a corporation yeah. over and over again <laughs> and I don't know what he, what point he was trying to make there but but right. in regards to like when when he focused on on policy on um on the realities of governing, he seemed to be believable. He seemed to be honest for the most part. Yeah. He was really, I found him to be really articulate about the realities of governing, whether or not that's that's good or bad. You, mm-hmm. know, you could want an outside candidate or you could think that Cuomo is, is part of the Albany, you know, swamp, so to speak. Right. But, um, well, do we want to talk about that for a little bit? Sure. Because I don't really know too much about it. I know that... Um, he had uh, close friends who were indicted and later convicted on um, insider trading, I believe. Joe Prococo and Elaine Calleros. Yeah. yeah. The main point that I want to make is that uh, he doesn't have the best reputation, certainly. There is at least the... If he himself is not corrupt, he is... Um, close to people who have been convicted of corruption. Absolutely. I agree with you. I don't know much about state government at all. I've mainly known and weighed in federal government. And, you know, I, I wish I knew more about our local and state government. But from what from what my understanding of our state government is, is that Albany is a very corrupt place. 
it has been that way for a long time and every single person who runs for office to get into Albany campaign campaigns on I hate I'm not going to use draining the swamp because that's affiliated with Trump but campaigns on uh what is it um sort of transparency and reform ethics there it is ethics reform and so I've heard a lot of critiques of Cuomo in terms of him dragging his feet or deflecting on ethics reform that didn't come up in the debate tonight. It came up with those two individuals who were uh, charged from Cuomo's administration. Right. But yeah, I mean, I, I am certainly as a, as a voter wary of Albany corruption. We've had a number of famous politicians in Albany become indicted and, you know, go to jail. And Sheldon Silver is one of them who I believe ran the assembly as a Democrat. Uh, again, state politics I should know more about. But yeah, I think Albany has a serious corruption problem, especially because there's so much money flying around with like the Buffalo Billion Project and upstate revitalization projects. There's a lot of places in there that that money can kind of go awry. And I just wish that Cuomo would take a stronger stance on ethics reform and actually say something that really inspired me to think that he's doing something about it. Mm -hmm. Um, You actually just reminded me of something, and it's kind of shifting gears a little bit, but I I would like to bring it up so I don't forget it. Um, I I remember that... On a, a few occasions, Governor Cuomo made a point of bringing up the fact that New York State has had a Republican-controlled Congress for yeah. most of its history. He said there were two years. I think one was 1965, and the other one was 2009. And the weird thing was that he kind of, not entirely, but kind of undermined his point by saying that in 2009, New York State had a democratically er- elected governor, a Demo- democratic majority in congress and yet still at least he said nothing got done and i mean uh if if we're correct and i believe we are that andrew cuomo started serving in 2010 um he he may he said that i know how to get things done Mm -hmm. um but it's just interesting that he also was like complaining the whole time not the whole time he was complaining about a Republican controlled Congress and and he tied that in to his his um his stand against Trump and everything else. Yeah. I think in response to that Matt, so New York has something called the IDC, the uh Independent Democratic Caucus, I believe. Mm-hmm. And again, there's people out there who would do a much better job at articulating this than I, but but the IDC is essentially meant that there's a small group of Democrats in the uh the state legislature that caucus or party or work with the republicans and that's been going on for a while now to the irksome of many self-proclaimed liberals including myself where we live in a ostensibly really liberal state you know mainly around where cities are but in every presidential election new york has gone you know stolidly liberal for a while yet our state government is oftentimes run by Republicans, either even in the governor's seat, as in, you know, in the mid-2000s, or especially in the state legislature, it's been run by Republicans for a while. Even though there are more Democrats, there's a small section of Democrats who caucus with the Republicans. I, I don't know the exact reasons for those. You know, I, I could just botch it in some of the, the reports I've read, but you can look that up elsewhere. But but there is a strong notion here where, like, uh, it goes back to that governing thing where I, I at least acknowledge or appreciate just realistic acknowledgement of the difficulties of governing. Mm. But but to your point as well, Matt, yeah, it was interesting to hear Cuomo say that, like, look, you can have Democrats in the state legislature, the governor's seat, and, you know, in, in cities and towns and counties, and it still doesn't matter. And he, he kept saying, unless people get it done, and he kept saying he's the guy to get it done. Yeah. Which reminded me a lot like Trump. Uh, it's not the best quality that I that I enjoy out of someone, of them saying they're the savior. Well, I'm the one who can do this. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I think, unfortunately, you probably have to play that part a little bit just because people want to hear. Well, I mean, you have to tout yourself, basically, yeah. because you're campaigning to for a position. But um, when speaking of comparisons to Trump, there was an, another point where uh, he, when um, I think Cynthia Nixon brought up the corruption charges against Joe Prococo, mm-hmm. and um, and Andrew Cuomo had the mo- had the most like Trump like response of the night, where he said something like, uh, "What what Joe did was very awful, it was very bad. Uh, he's going to be paying for it. Um, everybody everybody agrees that I had nothing to do with it." Mm. 
that was just it was very reminiscent of Trump for me. Right. But um, we should probably shift gears a little bit and talk about Cynthia Nixon now. Yeah, let me actually jump. Let's w- one last point about Cuomo on that point, Matt. It's actually really interesting with Cuomo's story because he he actually used to be, I think, fairly good, or at least colleagues with Trump, from my understanding. Really, uh, Trump and Cuomo got along for quite some time in terms of uh, just their dealings because they're both very influential New Yorkers. Mm-hmm. And I've read reports in the New York Times that they're. I mean, this is a complete one eighty from. Uh, on behalf of Cuomo to just go completely against Trump. Like Cuomo is selling himself as the anti-Trump guy, right? That is a complete 180 from what the relationship used to be. So that's interesting to me that Cuomo used to have an uh, an okay relationship with Trump. But again, Trump was never like president. So Trump has changed himself as well. You know, the Trump we see today is not the Trump who, I mean, yes, there are many similar qualities of him lying and being. But it it is different. Right. But there's also... uh, Cuomo used to be very close with Mayor Bill de Blasio of New York City, and now it's sort of there. It's sort of notorious of their fallout and their relationship, and you could hear that coming out in the debate. Where I don't know if it's the best question, but Cuomo was asked, you know, would you accept de Blasio's nomination? Or do you want it? Is or, what he was asked. You're right. Do yeah. you want Mayor de, de Bill de Blasio's uh, not nomination, but endorsement? endorsement right, yeah. endorsement. And he said, well, he kind of you know deflected and. Um, both of them deflected actually both of them yeah they both said they both said it's neither and it's neither politics but the but also Cuomo uh, on the MTI on the MTA and a lot of other funding uh, questions especially mm-hmm. for New York City because it's so influential in New York State he you could hear the tension between him and de Blasio so I, I don't know what those things are worth but it is interesting to see Cuomo change so much in terms of his past relationships right and again what is most striking to me about andrew cuomo is how he is selling himself now because again i've never seen cuomo as the most left dude out there a lot of people on the left i think would critique cuomo as not being all that left but he's really rebranded himself to be the stanchion the liberal stanchion against donald trump yeah um if elected it'll be interesting to see if he lives up to those claims Right, or if this is just a ploy to get himself reelected, who knows? But shifting to Cynthia Cuomo's candidate, uh, yeah, challenger for the yeah. Democratic seat, Cynthia Nixon. I was, uh, I was impressed, honestly. Hmm. Um, she doesn't have any prior experience in government, which I think is a detriment. Like, I do want to see some level of experience, but in terms of what she knows she seemed very informed very knowledgeable i think a lot of that probably comes from her work in activism um she had a very nuanced response to a very poor question regarding the legalization of marijuana and uh its effects on uh minorities the uh huge differences in the number of people who are or or the ethnic makeup of people who are arrested for possession for example, mm-hmm. I think it was something she s- she said like everybody uses about the s- about at about the same rate no matter what your ethnicity or, or race, but um, African American and Latino or Latinx um, people are arrested about eighty percent of the time more. Yeah, I, d- I don't. Quite I don't know. I mean, I yeah. mean, I know that it is significant. I don't mm-hmm. know what the actual numbers are, but I know that 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 felt accurate to me. Um, so I, I will close my opening statements about <laughs> my reaction <laughs> to Cynthia Nixon's performance by saying I was impressed. <laughs> what was your initial? What did, what's your initial thoughts, Jason? I actually wasn't all that impressed. You weren't. So as a self-identified, f- fairly self-identified Democratic Socialist, again, I, you know, I I struggle to go into these debates of what these monikers mean. Mm-hmm. I generally support Democratic Socialism. So let's leave it at that. I came into the debate expecting to enjoy what Cynthia Nixon had to say a lot more than how I felt leaving the debate. Okay. So I, I really I really thought and hoped that she would have not a stronger performance because, again, this isn't about individuals. I, I'm really bugged in how politics today has become this contestant of individuals. I, I really think politicians need to be advocating for if not their policy, then people. And I know that sounds really simple, but I think that from my understanding of how politics used to play throughout this country, politicians used to campaign on behalf of their parties, not themselves. And it was really seen as lowbrow politics to talk about yourself Mm -hmm. in politics. 
you know, back in like the mid 1800s. Like you wouldn't normally be like, I am the candidate. I do this. My record is that you would campaign on the party. And so you were the leader of the party. And so I think there's problems of there being, you know, party politics. Well, I mean, the problem here is that this is a primary. So it's kind of difficult to campaign on the strength of party. That's a great point. But even in general, I think there's too much I in politics. Like, take out the I, you know, get yourself out of the center because this isn't about you. And, and But I'm kind of going off track. So, <laughs> But um, about Cynthia Nixon, though, if I have to say about her performance, one, I, I don't appreciate interrupting a lot. You know, She again, did do that a lot. And, yeah. and to Governor Cuomo's credit, he seemed to refrain from that for the most part. Yeah. But to get to the heart of the issues, you know, I generally agree with most of her platforms like that she has. I, I generally agree with single player health care. I generally agree with campaign finance reform. I, you know, solidly agree with fighting inequality and uh, corporatization. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with the legalization of marijuana, but why I left not feeling so strong about her is because I didn't feel like she was articulating a solid vision of democratic socialism like i was surprised that that came out at the end she didn't even invoke it like someone called her the democratic socialist candidate and she was like yeah that's me you know and i was like where where are you what is your platform because i I was worried that cuomo's entire shtick was going to be i'm the anti-trump guy but i left actually pretty impressed because he wasn't just the anti-trump guy like he had a lot of that but he was saying all these things that he wanted to do i at least felt that but I, I left watching Cynthia Nixon just being like she's the anti Cuomo guy, right? And so I don't think that's a really great way to govern if you're just separate if you're just defining yourself as the antithesis of your opponent. Yeah. So uh, you know I know she does stand for things, and again, all this reflection is coming from a less than a one hour debate that we saw. Right. So I I would have to do more research, but I I didn't really see her as like the stolidly le- left or democratic socialist candidate. Yeah, I mean, I, I do agree. She definitely really focused in on on branding herself as the op the uh, alternative to Cuomo, and and she was very aggressive in sort of like pointing out what she thinks are his flaws. And I don't really know enough about Cuomo to know if she was fair in her judgment of him or not. Um, but to play devil's advocate a little bit, I don't feel like there were too many questions asked where she necessarily had the opportunity to really sort of let that democratic socialist side of her shine. Mm. There weren't too many like questions about the economy. There was a question about infrastructure regarding the um the, the uh, MTA that we kind of brought up. Mm-hmm. And then there was the talk about the legalization of marijuana and healthcare. But yeah, there weren't any like Oh, she did bring up Janice Versus yep. asking, there was the uh, we should talk about that. There's the um, yeah. the right for um, public, public unions yep. to strike, mm-hmm. and I did not like Andrew Cuomo's response to this at all. He 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 made a very a slippery slope argument that if you if you let public unions have the right to uh, strike, then teachers won't teach the kids, education will be ruined, uh, no- nothing will nothing will get done, everything the city will be. In, in flames or, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cynthia Nixon was very supportive of, of public unions' right to, to strike. Um, she came very close to articulating, I think, the reason why a union should be able to strike. She said that unions don't want to strike. They use it as last resort. I believe the moderator asked her, like, even if it means, like, shutting down the city or something. I, the point that I wanted her to make was that workers are the city. Yeah. And that... um. I think that would be the democratic socialist answer to give. It's like if the workers aren't being taken care of, then the city's not being taken care of anyway. Right. So we gotta we have to focus on the people. We have to take care of them. I, I appreciate you bringing that up because I'm always bothered by this notion that like, oh, if public sector employees go on strike, then the city shuts down and the people won't like that. Like, do you think that <laughs> these public sector employees are not the people? You know, when you say the people, if we go back to our very first show on evidence of design, we're defining who are who's the American people. Like, I, we might have even talked about this. Like These workers are the American people, too. And, and I, I did appreciate her response to Matt, Cynthia Nixon's response to the question uh, if public sector employees should have the right to strike. And she said, Cynthia Nixon said that they should have the right to strike because 
if their means are not being met, then as a last resort, they need to do something about it. And that as public sector employees, the people are essentially their forum, meaning the people should be responsive to their plight and need to strike. Yes. And I, I definitely appreciate that. Whereas Cuomo, and it seemed like even Mayor Bill de Blasi of New York City are against the notion of public sector employees having the ability to strike. And so that was a, a marked difference. And maybe we should do a point by point of some of the issues that came up. So this was a, an area of whether or not public sector employees sh should have the right to strike. That was an area where they markedly differed. Mm -hmm. Cuomo thinking one thing, Cynthia Nixon uh, thinking another. You brought up health care, Matt, in that Cynthia Nixon seemed to be very much on the uh, single payer side. She said she supports single payer. She thinks that health care is a human right. And notably, you said, and she said that she thinks that health care or doing these health care reforms should start at the state level. However, Cuomo, although he, he wasn't really against the notion of a single payer system. I would say he's lukewarm on the idea. Yeah, he, he went he sort of went to that uh, the practicality side. Yeah. Like, oh, this is tricky. And he said, again, kind of going towards Trump and the federal government, that this should be a federal thing and not necessarily a state thing. So he was deflecting that a little bit. So that was an area where they differed a little bit. The legalization of marijuana. Cynthia Nixon strongly supports the legalization of marijuana. She supports it based upon a racial injustice grounds. Mm -hmm. w and Andrew Cuomo uh, also supports the legalization of marijuana now, whereas, as we mentioned, he did not in the past. But he uh, he is sort of a generally in favor of legalizing it now. And he said that it was because of the, I guess, research done by a panel that he conducted back in January, I believe. Yep. And another issue that came up was funding for infrastructure and transportation. I, I think these questions are mainly about New York City because it's, it's such a hot issue. Um, you know, I have the luxury of, of knowing about and traveling to New York City every now and again. And I know that New Yorkers in general, if I can make that statement, are fairly, uh, well, they're pretty mad about the transportation system down there because, you know, it's an old system. It's over 100 years old. Mm -hmm. It used to be the finest in the world, but, you know, it's crumbling, it's old, it's underfunded. And, yeah, if you've ever ridden on the New York City subway, like, you know, I think it's fine. But if I had to do that every single day to get to and from work, yada, 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 there's problems. And so Cuomo was kind of deflecting a little bit on how the MTA should be funded. He said that, well, the city, again, is sort of somewhat rival or broken friendship with de Blasio. The city should pick up more funding. Whereas Nixon was saying, uh, no, you just got to fund it more. Like, there are people who can't get to work and you need to fund it. So, Right. And... I think, well, Cuomo might seem to, his defense of that was uh, that the money is just not there, that he can't do it. Would, I don't know if that's true or not, but I f feel like that would have been one of the points where you, you Jason, were feeling sympathetic to him. In that yeah, I, honestly, I was. I thought he articulated that a lot. You know, w when that question was asked, I was like, yeah, let's fund transportation because obviously it's like an awesome thing. But I, then again, I have no idea what that entails, you know. Um, I think it should be possible to fund transportation. Like, you know, I think that if we needed to, we should put a 0.5% tax on the wealthiest 1% of New Yorkers. Great. It's funded. You know, <laughs> job done. Yeah. Um, but uh, again, I'm maybe I would change if I knew. Just put Trump's border wall budget into <laughs> New York's <laughs> transportation system instead. Right. But again, you know, I'm also coming from a, a perspective of I have no idea what it takes to run a... Yes government budget so um i i sort of have to give i have to genuflect a little bit to cuomo uh, or any politician in this regard when it comes to budgeting although i think we we have a responsibility as a people right. you know to to push them and say well look find the money that was a recorded discussion between co-host matt treadwell and i on the democratic primary debate for new york state governor you can find the debate online and the primary election is this Thursday, September 13th. Thank you for listening to Evidence of Design. We'll be back live next week, and you can stay in touch with us on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Also, a big thank you to J.D. Flores for talking with me about disability rights advocacy and to WXIR for being a platform for these discussions. Until next week, be well, be safe, bye-bye, and thanks for listening.